because it's unified around a central theme that is um, how, what certain maps mean to me. Um, so I'm just going to start with uh, a quote from Jose Saramago. Um, so the virtue of maps, they show it can be done with limited space. They foresee that everything can happen therein. Uh, Jose Saramago was a magical realist author. Um, he wrote this. Hmm? Yeah, exactly, totally. And this, this book is, um, the, the quote comes from a book where the central plot is uh, the Iberian Peninsula has broken off of mainland Europe and started floating out into the Atlantic. And of course, yeah, magical realists, they have to do something like that. But uh, the, the many different political and cultural and social implications that come out of that are, um, are astonishing. It's, maps are a great framework of imagination. Um, and then, just because we're, you know, briefly mentioning uh, the work of magical realism, um, I have to point out one of uh, cartographers' favorite quotes is a paragraph-long short story by Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, it's called On Exactitude in Science, and he wrote it as though it were a fragment of a longer piece written by an explorer in the 17th century. Um, and he writes, in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city, and the map of the empire the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the cartographer's guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with it. <laughs> the following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the vast map was useless, and not without some pitilessness was it, that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winter. 
In the deserts of the West, still today, there are tattered ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. Uh, what I like about that one is that he, um, he really foretold a position that we find ourselves in today. Uh, we, we do have a one-to-one -one map today. We have a digital one-to-one -one map. And by the end of this talk, I hope to uh, give you a few examples of what that means and what some of the implications of it are. Um, but first order of business is to show the maps that I'm going to be discussing. Uh, these are three maps. This is uh, a, a British Ordnance Survey map of the Bremen Quadrant in Germany. Uh, this is a FHA um, loan, where I guess there's a different term for it, but I'll get to it later. Uh, a broadly a loan availability map for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and then this is an aerial photo uh, from uh, it's actually a fragment of the New North End in Burlington. Um, what unites them is that they were all created in 1937, uh, which is sort of a happy accident because they, um, for lack of a better narrative, all of these maps have great personal meaning to me, um, uh, despite the fact that I was definitely not alive in 1937. Um, so we're going to discuss them one by one, and as I mentioned, sort of go forward and back through time. So first map, the Ordnance Survey one. First, we need to go back 800 years. Uh, this is a map created in the Song Dynasty in China uh, in 1137. Um, obviously, you can see it was made on clay, uh, and the primary items of interest here are rivers, waterways. There are some roads in here as well. Uh, but the general idea is this is a navigation map. What makes this a unique map uh, is that this is one of the first instances that we have of a grid being applied to mapping. So, uh, the way that this would have been created would have been the, um, the cartographers of the empire, like, uh, like Borges is imagining. Uh, in this case, going out to create not a one-to-one -one scale, but as best they can. And in the capital, they would have laid a grid down this general area, and then sent people to each individual quadrant, and then report what they found there, combine it into a large map. This is, uh, this is a grid transfer method that's still used today for all sorts of map expansion and contraction. Um, but this is the first time when uh, a cartographer is thinking in, well, not the first time, certainly, but one of the first times in which a group of cartographers were thinking beyond what they could see from ground level, thinking, how do we put all this together into a large composition? What is the scale of that map? It's a good question. I'm, uh, I don't even, honestly, I haven't georeferenced this one, so I don't even know if that's like the Yangtze or if it's uh, a more minor river. Uh, it could be anything from one to twenty-four thousand to one to a million. I don't. I don't really know. It's certainly not one to one, though. <laughs> not on clay. That would be uh, We're going to advance a bit. Uh, so in 1632, um, we find that uh, map technology has changed a little bit. Navigation technology has changed a little bit. Uh, there are now concepts of latitude and longitude, although still being used in a sort of relative sense. Uh, but they allow people like our good old friend Samuel de Champlain to be able to navigate from uh, his home base in France all the way to the New World. Um, and in the course of his travels, um, he, he went everywhere from, uh, from uh, the Santo Domingo colony in the Caribbean uh, all the way north into what is now Labrador in his travels, and he saw lots and lots of things, uh, mostly from the perspective of a coastline. Um, but when he was done with all of these travels, he returned to France, he wrote his, uh, you know, he wrote one of his <laughs> memoirs, he created maps from the information that he had collected. Um, these maps, you can see, are probably pretty good if you're navigating along a coastline in a ship. Um, the, the general sense of where one river outlet is versus another uh, all makes sense. And the tools that he would have used here uh, would have been fairly basic, just uh, pens, maybe a, a compass for determining like approximate distance. Um, the, the general idea that what was in his mind needed to be put on paper uh, was the central act of cartography. That was what he was doing. Uh, he wasn't trying to necessarily uh, fill in gaps in a holistic piece of global mapping. He was trying to map where he had been and convey that information to others. This obviously is not Champlain. This is a Vermeer painting called The Geographer that I love, so I use it at every opportunity I get. Uh, but it's contemporary, so maybe these are similar uh, environments to what Champlain would have been working in. 
Uh, but uh, this approach has its limits, and obviously, if you uh, even if you have a good sense of approximate latitude, like how far from the equator, how far from the poles you are, if you know the circumference of the Earth, and your calculations can get you to the right place, even then, you get a few things wrong. Uh, Lake Champlain doesn't really look like this. <laughs> So uh, on, the, on the previous slide, you can see he actually had a north arrow. The approximate projection would have been a geographic one. Uh, and he still you know, has the orientation of the lake completely out of whack. Uh, there's that thing marked number 66. I've been looking all over maps. I have no <laughs> idea what body of water he's talking about there. Um, but you can see that like, this man traveled down this lake in a canoe on one side and then the other. You can see where the river outlets were. Uh, and he marked them. And then he had a sense of, uh, you know, I've been along this Atlantic coast as well. Can't be that far. <laughs> white mountains? No idea what that. You know what? Those mountains that we're seeing from Lake Champlain, those must be the white mountains. Let's just assume it's a small band and the Atlantic's right on the other side. Uh, you see the problems that can be created when you do everything from the ground level and when you're using only an internal sense of reference. Uh, by 1750, things were getting a little bit more formalized. Uh, this is the, uh, the Grand Survey of France done by the Cassini family in 1750. Uh, this is one of the first attempts to really lock down what latitude and longitude meant and to create an absolute sense of reference. Uh, so what they did was they uh, walked a straight line, an approximate line of longitude from Dunkirk to Barcelona. Uh, along the way they triangulated and I uh, Trigonometry was never my, my strong suit, but I, uh, I do understand that survey methods in this time uh, and a little before and certainly all, almost all the way up to the present day are based on the idea that uh, from distance you can calculate angle and from angle you can calculate distance. Um, so knowing those things, they were able to lay down uh, an exact line of longitude uh, that just happened to pass through Paris uh, and would ultimately uh, include the site of the future Paris Observatory uh, and create a, uh, an absolute reference system. Uh, the idea being that if you happen to be in Orléans, you could say Paris is exactly this distance and exactly this barrier from where I am now. This is uh, an attempt to provide meaning on a global scale and have this system be something that could be replicated worldwide. Um, it was such a useful system that by 1784, in the middle of what can only be described as a fairly extended period of war between France and England, uh, <laughs> centuries? I don't know. Uh, they, uh, cartographers of France and England, coordinated to create a combined grand survey uh, in order to, uh, to match what had been created as separate absolute systems of latitude and longitude. Uh, and the one that we've largely adopted today is the one that passes through the Greenwich Observatory as zero. But this survey, as almost like an active piece, like a, a gesture of, of its importance, um, locked the two together in an absolute way. So somebody standing in London could use, could use this absolute reference system to determine how far and at what bearing the city of Paris was, and indeed anything else on the world. Um, <coughs> Actually, I should say, if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt me throughout. I, I have the microphone, so it might be kind of hard to overpower all the ranting I'm doing here. But, uh, if you have questions, please, please interrupt. Um, by 1858, uh, this system was being used worldwide. Uh, this is uh, a gentleman named Everest. Uh, happened to be coordinating a large-scale survey of the Himalaya, uh, part of Britain's colonies in, in South Asia. Uh, in the course of doing this triangulating, incredibly difficult work, uh, crossing the Himalaya with uh, chains and with sites and with uh, teams of hundreds trying to get this work done, um, this, uh, this particular effort uncovered uh, what it, you know, was understood at that time to be the largest mountain in the world. And uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Everest, who was probably Lord Everest at the time, uh, very humbly named it after himself, <laughs> continued surveying north. Uh, so this, this method, this triangulation method of providing this absolute, uh, this absolute grid um, was used very far into the, into the modern era. So uh, what was his 
What was the goal in doing that mapping? The goal in doing that mapping was to be able to determine exact size and distances of an empire. And for Britain, that was, um, I guess the, the idea that they would be able to uh, navigate and determine bearings was really like one of the fundamental underpinnings of uh, how they collect resources from all the different corners of the empire. Uh, and if you, if you know approximately um, you know, how far it is from one trading point to another, then you can plan on a more broad scale for like where should the roads go? Uh, what, are the, what are the resources that need to be allocated here? Um, in, in a way, there, there are critical geographers who can do this far better than me, but there is a really good argument to be made that surveying the land was the, the act of ownership. And, and for the British Empire, that would have been, well, we've surveyed it. We planted a flag here. This is clearly ours. Uh, do you know the exact distance to the next town? Of course not. That means it's ours. Um, so yeah, there's a real like colonial underpinning to the, the act of mapping the whole world. And this, for example, like the idea that uh, this was surveying in the field and laying down this massive grid, uh, there's uh, an idea that it was a, an adventurous sort of work. And in some ways, it probably was. This is a painting uh, referencing an incident that happened with a German survey team in Singapore. Um, but uh, these people were going into lands that, uh, to, to their perspective, were unknown and had not been mapped, and trying to lay down some sort of reference, some sort of sense of order on it, uh, where uh, previously it had just been a blank spot on the map for them. Obviously not a blank spot on the map for the people who live there, but this is a difficult thing. Um, so as is the case with many technologies, war uh, advances certain types of technology uh, faster than uh, times of peace. The British Ordnance Survey, which was founded uh, as a response to a Scottish rebellion in the Highlands in the 18th century, uh, was tasked in World War I with making maps of the battlefields in mainland Europe. Uh, hundreds of surveyors died in the process of trying to actually, uh, what, what these gentlemen are doing is the same sort of triangulation work that we've seen examples of so far, but they're trying to do it under fire. And they're trying to, to use it to map trench networks and towns and places that um, would, would have been you know, important to the war effort, but in the process they would have also been increasing that level of detail. Whereas before, with Everest survey, you would have seen maybe a, a 1 to 600,000 scale map. These gentlemen would be mapping down to a 1 to 5,000 scale map. They'd be aiming for military actionability. And in the process, they'd be making some pretty cool and more broadly useful maps. Um, and the reproduction of these things also took off during World War I. This is a, this is a, a organ survey reproduction shop that was imported entirely to France so that they could get these uh, quadrant maps in the hands of you know a lieutenant on the front line as quickly as possible as they were updating them. Imported from where? Uh, imported from England. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, just that they had you know this was so central to the war effort that they would move all these resources as close as possible. Um, so uh, where did we go? I think I'm going to skip a few. Huh? I apologize. I think I've jumped a few slides, but. Uh, one of the outgrowths of this ordnance survey mapping um, was a different types of map for different types of military applications. Uh, and in 1937, obviously, uh, England was concerned about uh, a ramp up to war with Germany. Uh, they issued, the ordnance survey issued a series of maps of, um, of Germany, and actually of all of mainland Europe. Uh, but this was for aerial navigation. Uh, they, saw, they foresaw the need for, um, for bombing, for navigation aids. Uh, and this particular map is, uh, honestly, it's one of my favorite maps, despite its pretty horrific purpose. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful map uh, meant for a very utilitarian uh, intent. Um, these navigational aids you see, these, uh, these compasses with their, with their uh, specific indicators along them, they're sprinkled all around the map. There are probably a dozen of them in the course of a sheet that's about that big. Um, and the, the way that the bathymetry is rendered is beautiful in its own way, but it's still a useful map if you're trying to navigate from the air. You can use it to follow roads, you can use it to, um, to have names attached to particular places, and indeed to targets. Um, so this specific map would have been in the, uh, in the hands of the navigator of uh, a B-24 uh, flown by my grandfather, uh, who was also named Bill. 
Um, so, uh, in the course of a raid on a, a rail trestle uh, that was in the southern part of this brown quadrant map, um, his plane was shot down and he was killed. Uh, some of his crew survived, but, but he didn't. Um, and the way that the military indicated this was with exactly the same map that he had probably carried with him. Uh, this is a, I apologize for the quality of this because it's a declassified photocopy of the original. Uh, so we're, we're a few layers removed from the, that original somewhat beautiful map that I, I was talking about. Um, but they, uh, the folks who, the members of the squadron who survived and returned to the base uh, reported uh, in a after action report that uh, my grandfather's plane had gone down somewhere around here. And the, the analyst who was taking this information would have asked for a precise location if available, but uh, you assume it's a squadron and taking fire, maybe you don't necessarily see where the crash happens. Uh, but they just indicated it was somewhere in this circle, um, and uh, we assume all hands were lost. And that action, that drawing the circle on the map, uh, is freighted with so much meaning. <laughs> and it's, uh, the map wasn't intended for this purpose when it was created, it was an aerial navigation map. Uh, but all of a sudden it has huge amounts of my family history bound up into it. Um, certain, you know, certain paths that were taken and others that, that, uh, that were not, and uh, it lends a geographic significance to a place that I've never been, but is um, incredibly important to my, to my family. Uh, and someday I'd love to go there, but my German is really rusty, so I don't necessarily know that would go well. Um, so, this is the first map that I wanted to speak about that had, uh, that had meaning ascribed to it. This is one of the ways that a map can gain meaning, um, and also some of the many ways that it can, that it can be created technologically, some of its back. <laughs> uh, the next map, as I mentioned, is uh, of Philadelphia, and that is sort of where the story continues from uh, my grandfather's death. So, in 1937 in Philadelphia, uh, a um, an organization of the New Deal, uh, the FHA, uh, Federal Housing Administration, I think. Yeah, they had, sorry, there are so many acronyms, I never exactly remember which ones mean, so for me, uh, mean which, but uh, the, the FHA was tasked with uh, making homeownership available to Americans. Um, this is, the idea that this is one of the most basic underpinnings of prosperity uh, was true then and remains true now. Um, the ability to build equity, to build wealth, and to make it multi-generational and lasting, really, uh, the federal government at this point identified that homeownership was one of the key ways to do that, and they wanted to make it available to people who previously had not had access to this sort of thing. Um, so, one of the ways they went about this in a practical way uh, was with determining where they could give loans and where they couldn't. Uh, this is a map of Philadelphia. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a Wurzner map. This was not originally created by the FHA, but the FHA took this map and drew onto it. Um, and I should say specifically a sub-agency of the FHA called the Homeowners, Lo Homeowners Loan Corporation um, made this map. Um, but this is what they did with the map of Philadelphia. You can see it's multicolored. Uh, is anybody here familiar with Philadelphia? I apologize if this I'm is. looking for my street. Oh yeah, where are you from? <laughs> Logan, Strawberry Mansion, North Philadelphia. Step right up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, would you mind pointing out where that is? Be interesting. Turn the lights out, maybe you can see it better, Bob. I bought the shelf still like for 35 years. Oh yeah? yeah. Oh, wait, there we go. So, Oh, oh, wow. That's oh, right. Oh, Thank you. I don't know why. Um, yeah, so wait, sorry. Are you saying, like, was that, was that have been North, North Broad Street? Okay. Go North Broad Street. Yeah, yeah. So. This is City Hall? Uh, I think. No, no, it's City Hall. I think that's City Hall. That's great. And then the penitentiary would be, like, over here somewhere. So. Yeah, in the penitentiary. That was it. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, that penitentiary was good real estate. Uh, <laughs> along the building. What? The, the penitentiary is along the building. It's um, yeah, and that yeah. it was one of the um, what, what was the it was revolutionary at the time to build. What's the style? They, it's, there's a name for it. It's uh, the idea you can see everybody, everybody from the from the middle yeah. at any time. Um, Panopticon. 
It was to, it was designed as a, a panopticon. Uh, I love that. But yeah, it has, it has spoke shapes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so Ward is in the middle. It's C to every possible direction. Oh man, I, this is the I wish I wish I could discuss prison architecture for a long time. Next. <laughs> But uh, so this, this is the map that the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, created to guide their actions in Philadelphia. And you can see that it's a thematic map. It has um, the different colors mean different things. Um, so the specific things that they meant uh, were whether or not uh, a loan was a good idea for any particular area. So, First grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and then we don't really care about the rest. Um, the first two, first and second grade, would be almost certainly guaranteed an FHA loan. Third grade, eh, you might be a little bit dodgy with that. You're probably going to require some specific review. Uh, fourth grade settlement area was almost entirely rejected for FHA loans. Uh, and this was, I, I'm sure at the time they saw this as sort of a triage action. Like, we can't give everybody a loan. That would be crazy. So they, they tried to narrow down with the help of, of some local input uh, where they should go. Um, so my family's story picks up here, um, which is in West Philly. Uh, so my grandmother and grandfather had lived here. Um, my grandfather died uh, and left my grandmother to raise my mother uh, in, let's see, yeah, right about there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, you know, it's off of Thompson Street. I don't remember exactly what the, I don't remember exactly where uh, the address is. But um, they were able to get uh, a loan for the, the place where they were living. Um, they were just on the border here. You can see, um, that's, I think that was the grade C area. It was potentially dodgy, but, uh, but worth a try. So they were able to actually get a loan. Uh, eventually, they moved a little bit further out into media, into the suburbs, again, uh, with, a, with a backed loan, um, a backed mortgage. Uh, and from there, uh, all sorts of things uh, happened. They, I, I don't mean to get too whimsical about this, but the, the idea that my grandmother could get a loan for a house there is the foundation of my own personal prosperity. Uh, one of the just simple little things, like I've... Um, I've never, I've never gone hungry. I've never had a, you know, a meal that I wasn't sure what I was going to get. I haven't, um, I haven't really suffered in my life economically uh, because, among numerous other reasons, my grandmother was able to start building equity in a home uh, a long, long time ago um, in the in the forties. Um, and that carried on into an ability for, uh, for her daughter, for my mother, to, um, to get a college education. And that college education was able to be leveraged for additional loans for homeownership when she decided to do something crazy like move from Philadelphia to Derby, Vermont. Uh, <laughs> I don't think she was the only one either. I think, there were, I think that was part of the wave. Uh, but. Uh, from there, uh, I, I find that my own personal prosperity is really tied up in the fact that my grandmother was able to get an FHA loan. Uh, however, that makes me consider who's on the other side of that line. And I'm, I'm sure most of you have, have intuited this, it's largely black folks yep. who live here. Um, and throughout the life of uh, the Homeownership Loan Corporation and their maps, which would be from the 30s until the, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 uh, abolished this idea, uh, the FHA was giving out loans to white folks, almost exclusively to white folks. Um, and it was codified. It was in these maps. They, they asked for local input, and the local input they got was from real estate agents, uh, you know, police departments, fire departments, uh, local councils, um, and obviously, I, I don't mean to gloss over the, the instances where um, where it wasn't entirely about um, about a racial division, but the way in which these racial divides persist today is astonishing. Today, most of the folks on that side of the line are black. Most of the folks on that side of the line are white. Um, these things are. Uh, after, after about 30 years of distributing loans this way, these things are almost impossible to overcome. Um, and 
it makes me wonder who, not necessarily who's left behind in a geographic sense, but who's left behind on the other side of that line in an economic sense while my family went on to prosper. Uh, and there, there are a lot of folks who were left behind. Um, but this, this happened nationally. This was not unique to Philadelphia. You'd find maps like this for Chicago, for um, Houston, for New York. Um, and it, you can still see the impact of it today. So that was the second map. Uh, actually, how am I doing on time? To, okay, um, I'm going to get into some modern technology now. So hopefully, I, I should leave about 15 minutes for questions. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Cool. Um, so the third one, as I mentioned, is an aerial photo from 1937. That's uh, Burlington's New North End. Uh, but first, we need to go back. <laughs> Just when you thought we were advancing to the, to the modern age. Uh, this map is a uh, clay tablet uh, from the Babylonian city, city of Nippur. Uh, and it's uh, one of the first instances that we have access to of people assigning uh, a, uh, a property survey. Uh, so you see there's a road, there's a river, uh, but there are also buildings. And the I, I don't know if cuneiform is the right indication for the script there, but What's written on those is the purpose of those buildings. So granary, temple, uh, dwelling. Um, this was a landowner, uh, a ruler of some kind in this area, mapping out what they owned. Um, and this is the foundation of like the, the property maps that we still have today. That if, if you're a homeowner, you have a map on record with the city that looks not unlike this, just with you know the purpose of the building and the dimensions of it and some of the other characteristics of it written in English instead of cuneiform, and preferably not on clay. It doesn't. Well, actually, it does keep pretty well. <laughs> hard to find. Yeah. Hard to find. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's folding it. Up. <laughs> folding it up. So. Um, yeah. So. Uh, advancing again radically into the future, this idea of uh, mapping land for uh, individual ownership. Uh, in 1798, a um, gentleman by the name of Ira Allen had already done a significant amount of mapping of the state, and uh, this, you know, Vermont in this period of time uh, was a series of settlements from people who had migrated from uh, Massachusetts, from Connecticut, uh, on grants issued by the governor of New Hampshire prior to the revolution. Uh, Ira and his brother Ethan had uh, run the folks with New York-based land grants out of the state by that point. Uh, so um, in the course of surveying and dividing up uh, these towns, uh, there would have been an instance of, OK, so, and this is just an example. I don't know if this is exactly how this went for uh, my hometown, Lindenville. Um, the town of Lindenville is a square on a map. It's just divided up somewhere in an office in Connecticut. Um, and the governor has decided that this, this gentleman, Ira Allen, is going to be the one to divide that up into individual parcels. And then land um, settlers and speculators from the cities along the coast will buy those individual parcels uh, and then send people to live on. Um, so Ira Allen's method of getting paid for this was pretty savvy. He, uh, he didn't generally accept cash. Um, he accepted payment in the form of a percentage of the total parcels he mapped. Um, so by the time he was done mapping a huge chunk of the state, he was also the single largest landowner of the state, uh, and did certain things with that land, like grant a uh, university. And that's uh, one of the reasons we have the University of Vermont. But um, you know, he approached it in a bit of a dodgy sort of way. But he was mapping these, uh, he was mapping these parcels so that people could have ownership and boundaries. Um, this idea of tax mapping and parcel mapping um, became much more formalized uh, in the more recent era um, for various purposes, not necessarily just for ownership. Um, this is an example of a, uh, a fire insurance map from the Sanborn Company. And this would have been, oh, sorry, did I just turn straight into my mic? Uh, this would have been uh, in the 1930s, maybe 1940? Oh, 1919, my bad. This is a much older one than that. Uh, but you can see that there are individual things being called out on the map. There are purposes of uh, the different churches and the, indeed the communities that they serve. Uh, in fact, I think, does that say? Yep, St. Joseph's Church. That's the French one. It actually says French in the little parentheses there. Uh, and then there, there would have been um, just a, a general sense of trying to nail down particular uses for each of these things. Uh, 
it goes into great detail in some cases. The, the General Ice Cream Corporation has quite a bit written about it there on the, uh, I think that's close to downtown, somewhere near Maine College. Uh, even though it's, it doesn't exist anymore, obviously. Ben and Jerry's has long since conquered that one. Um, but uh, so the people who match for Sanborn were doing it on foot. For the most part, they were arriving with a, maybe a general sense of the street grid. Um, but they would then be walking with a tape measure, getting actual dimensions of all of these buildings, dimensions and heights. It's an incre incredibly labor-intensive effort, but you gain a lot of information in the process. Uh, there's a quote from Daniel Carter Beard, who would then, after working for Sanborn as one of their assessors, go on to uh, co-found the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, his quote is, while working for Sanborn, I not only saw all those places I had heard about, but I made maps of them, I made diagrams of all the homes in each town and each city I visited. I took delight in putting into my records mention of real occupancy, genteel or disreputable. <laughs> After four or five years of this work, I knew a lot about our people, saints and sinners, rich and poor. And you get a sense that um, that human contact with what you're mapping uh, has gone away a bit in the modern era. Uh, and there's probably both uh, gain and loss in that. By 1937, uh, the Sanborn Company had switched over to aerial surveys for the basis of these maps. They were no longer uh, necessarily having people walk these places individually to get dimensions. Uh, following an advance in military technology, again, military technology, um, the, the art of aerial photography had gotten much better. After World War I, people realized that we can actually get really good maps just by flying and taking pictures. We don't necessarily need to lose hundreds of surveyors in the process. Um, so uh, these cameras, uh, it's a Fairchild camera type, uh, very high resolution, um, and meant to basically be flown over uh, any area for survey in a bit of an overlap. So if you fly uh, a straight line uh, in one direction for, say, 50 miles, do a bit of a bank, and then fly a straight line back for 50 miles, you make sure that those two paths that the camera's capturing are slightly overlapped, and you're able to do a stereogram. And a stereogram gives you a sense of height. Um, so the way that this was done, this is no longer Everest and his men trying to cross the Himalayas with, with a bunch of chains and, and you know, measurements. Uh, that does not look like a good position to be working in, but it would still be significantly easier than what would have been done even 100 years prior to this. So this gentleman is laying out a series of manual stereograms from aerial photography. Uh, and this, the area that he's working with um, on behalf of Sanborn is probably, um, I want to say this is probably about the size of the town of Colchester. So there would have been uh, some pretty significant detail in each of those photos. And he's making sure they're all lined up so that with uh, a, a stereo viewer on top of these coordinated places, you can actually see the terrain pop out. And from there, it can be used to transfer into um, topographic maps and to give really precise elevation information. Uh, and, incidentally, really precise boundary information based on uh, the things that can be seen. Um, so this is a, as close up an example uh, of this as I'm talking about. This is still Colchester, uh, and you can see that it's Vermont. There's forest, farm, fields, uh, not a lot in the way of dwellings, few roads. Uh, the dead giveaway of human activity is always the straight lines. And you can see those pretty clearly here. It's the field boundaries, the, in some cases, the roads. But for the most part, we're looking at a, a very pastoral landscape. Uh, and 1937 was the first time that uh, any such survey was captured in Vermont. Um, I'm sure in other cases, some aerial photos had been captured sort of here and there, but this was the first concerted effort. Uh, and I, I love this aerial survey so much that uh, I'll come back to it in the course of this talk, but I also made a, an online viewer where you can pan back and forth between the present day and, the, and 1937, uh, just because there's, there's always new things to see uh, as far as what's changed. Um, but one of the outgrowths of the, this ready availability of imagery is that a single analyst in a really horrible ergonomic position, no doubt, <laughs> would still be able to create a parcel map with a fair degree of accuracy without actually having to visit the location. So this really increased the, um, the accuracy, the, the temporal scale, the spatial scale, and the ability to make these things really quickly uh, with a minimum of effort. This is a real mechanization of, of uh, ground survey. Um, so 
were flying planes in 1937. 1946, uh, following the end of World War II, um, some scientists had different ideas about how you might be able to acquire images of the Earth's surface and then continue scaling up that information. Um, this is the first image of Earth taken from space. And this was a camera strapped to a V-2 buzz bomb that the United States had captured at the end of World War II. Um, and then they sort of pointed it into the stratosphere and then somehow recovered a frame on the camera that had not, you know, broken up on impact. Uh, but this is the first view we have of the ground from space. Uh, and there's not much to see here. I mean, I think we can tell that's a cloud bank, but otherwise I have no idea what we're looking at. Um, but you can, you can see the lights going off in cartographers' minds. <laughs> there's so much possibility here. Um, so satellite technology advanced really fast, again, partly owing to military endeavors. During the Cold War, spy satellites were being used left and right. Uh, the technology was advancing really fast. One of my favorite anecdotes of Cold War spy satellites is that um, prior to the advent of radio transmitted digital images, uh, the way that a spy satellite would return pictures to Earth that it had taken uh, was it would be mounted with a certain number of rolls of film. It would actually be exposing those rolls of film. When a roll was finished, it would get dropped into Earth's atmosphere, just fired with a little bit of, of uh, you know, a little bit of uh, push, uh, and then a parachute would pop out when it entered the stratosphere, and then the CIA had to coordinate an exact pass <laughs> with a plane to catch the parachute you know, oh my God. and then get that one roll of film that had been captured so that they could get a really grainy image of a Soviet airstrip somewhere. Um, so just the amount of effort that went into this uh, was still reflective of how much potential there was in this technology. Uh, but by 1973, the civilians get to get on up in the end, too. Uh, this was the first Landsat. Uh, this was launched as a joint endeavor between USGS and NASA um, in 1973. And this was able to take fairly coarse resolution images, but uh, freely available images for the public consumption. And the sort of thing you get out of that is this, which is um, a few deltas along the coast in Holland. Uh, you can see there are uh, canals here, there's a city built up over here. Um, you get a sense of where the river of sediment is flowing. Um, you have a real sense of where the agriculture is. And what this became incredibly useful for was environmental monitoring of all sorts. And this is scientists at this point really had an amazing tool on their hands. Um, what, uh, what made this particularly useful is that the pixels were 30 meters on a side, so the military was fine with that. They didn't really care if you couldn't see a tank. 30 meters on a side is, uh, I don't know, like the size of this building. Um, but uh, the temporal resolution of this was drastically increased. So uh, the way that this satellite was flying was sending it over the pole about 16 times a day, which meant that you could get a view of anywhere on Earth within like a two to three week window. Uh, and then two to three weeks later, you could get the same view again. And two to three weeks later, you could get the same view again, cloud cover depending. Um, but that allows you to see change. And that's the sort of thing that, um, that scientists have since been uh, leveraging really effectively. Uh, even a fairly coarse change, like you know, monthly or seasonally. Uh, technology advanced pretty rapidly. Uh, so that was a government launch satellite, although uh, there have been eight iterations of the Landsat satellite since then, and there are currently two still orbiting the Earth and taking regular images. Uh, but those are operated by USGS. Uh, in 2001, the first uh, privately held um, high-resolution satellite was launched. Uh, and this thing, you can see it's still about the same size as the, maybe a little bit smaller than Landsat was back in 1973. So the, the actual technology that needs to be up there is still very big. But man, the resolution you can get out of this thing. This took, I, mean, I can't even imagine the negotiation with the US military that it took to, to launch this. Um, because now you can see individual things. You can see, I mean, obviously this is the Sydney Opera House, but you can see uh, people walking those paths. You can see uh, the trajectory of boats. You can see, um, if you have more of these satellites, you can probably see where something was one day versus where it is the next day. Uh, well, actually, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. In 2001, this was just a, a, an advance in resolution. So, for a price uh, that was probably a little prohibitive for the general public, you could buy a high-resolution image of anywhere in the world. And it didn't matter if you were in the military or not. 
By 2014, uh, the high resolution is still there. Uh, now the best resolution you can get is about 30 centimeters on the side per pixel. So you can't read newspapers yet, but you can identify people. Uh, not by face, you can see that something is a person. Um, but 2014, uh, a company called Planet Labs released uh, a new concept to increase temporal resolution, uh, which is these things called CubeSats. But what these two guys are holding uh, is a satellite, and there are about 250 of these in orbit around Earth right now. Um, their spatial resolution isn't amazing, it's about 5 meters per pixel, uh, but what makes these particularly powerful is that they're constantly looking at every part of the Earth at once. Uh, it's, they call it a constellation. Uh, so it gives you things like this, where over the course of, this is probably like two weeks worth of imagery, you can watch um, when, when was the last one here? The last one was in February this year. So uh, you can watch uh, Lake Champlain freeze over with pretty great detail. And you can, when the national, uh, sorry, just as a point of reference, like this is the, uh, um, that's the uh, Winooski Delta there, that's Mallet's Bay, Plattsburgh is over there. Um, but when the National Weather Service uses imagery to say, okay, that's it, the lake's closed, uh, they're using much coarser resolution uh, imagery. Uh, this sort of thing could actually say, well, there's actually a tiny little tunnel still open, but that's, that's a minor quibble. Uh, you can obviously imagine what power there is in the ability to monitor these things over time. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that are available to us now. Uh, and images are not just images. The way that a machine interprets a map, a machine like this phone that got me here today because I had never been to this spot, I set up navigation on Google Maps, uh, the way that a machine interprets an image is different than the way that we do. Uh, we can see houses, roads, uh, streets. Uh, the way that a machine would interpret this is, oh, how, what sort of, um, what sort of analysis is being done through here? What, uh, those are just pixels. I want lines. I want trajectories. I want trips. Um, an algorithm that's going to determine whether or not there's a significant amount of traffic at a cloverleaf intersection is consuming, in addition to um, imagery data, it's consuming uh, telemetry data from individual phones um, and, able, and aggregating that and being able to say, oh, traffic has clearly slowed down right here on this particular line that we know to be a road. I'm sorry of anthropomorphizing algorithms. I apologize. I, what is each color? Uh, each color is just is, uh, directional travel. Um, so one car? No, 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 no. This is, um, this, this isn't publicly available data, but this is the sort of data that is um, purchasable and is collected by all of the cell phone carriers. Um, so it's, they, call it, uh, they call it anonymized. There's no, um, no identity information attached to it. Um, but there are, that's, that's a very fraught consideration because there are all sorts of ways to de-anonymize geographic data. Um, but I guess my point with this is just that um, the derivatives that we get out of satellite imagery and out of sensors, like the sensors in our phone, are exploding. They're all over the place. Um, the way that a algorithm is basically interpreting the landscape is through a series of points and lines. Um, if, it's a, if it's a navigation app, it's determining, okay, where's the next point at which we have to turn? And then from there, what's the shortest route? Um, the information that's now freely available, not necessarily for purchase, is also just going completely crazy these days. Um, this is uh, a series of 3D building extrusions from OpenStreetMap, which is uh, a program that's similar to Wikipedia in that anybody, it's an it's a open source map of the world. Anyone can edit it uh, for, for better and worse. Um, but this, map, this area in central Burlington has really detailed building footprints, including heights. Uh, so a fairly detailed map of the city can be made laying it on freely available detailed aerial imagery for free. Um, all of this stuff is just available to the public. Uh, Google is the, the incumbent in mapping these days, um, which is probably a position that would have surprised even them about 10 years ago. Um, but they, by advancing Google Maps as one of their primary business tools, have also advanced the technology almost as much as though they were at war. <laughs> The amount of technological advancement absent a conflict here is kind of startling. Uh, because Google purchases imagery from, from satellites, but they also build algorithms to detect buildings and then map them perfectly and then include them in a very easy interface for all of us to, to get access to. Um, I, I don't mean to 
to harp on Google too much, but they are also doing this entirely behind a walled garden. They don't make their data freely available. All the money that they're putting into these derivatives is staying with them. Um, but for better or worse, as I mentioned, they're the incumbent. They do amazing things with their maps. Um, and for those folks who have used uh, Google Earth, uh, this may look familiar. This is a, uh, a display that they bring with them to conferences. Um, I've seen it in person at a few, uh, a few mapping conferences. But uh, the basic idea here is that you want uh, Google Earth to be a little more immersive. So let's just put it up on a whole bunch of screens, give a small control in the front. Um, and the power of the world is at your fingertips. And it's not just geographic information. You can see they've tied it to Wikipedia articles. There's uh, endless historical, social, cultural information available uh, at your fingertips. Um, in, I, I particularly like this interface for its immersion, but we have all of the same data available in a phone like this. Uh, and that's Borges' map. That's the one that he claimed would um, not that he, he was staking a position, but he, in that story, talked about how people realized geography was useless as soon as it got to a one-to-one -one scale. And it's really anything but that uh, in the current scheme of things. But what happens most frequently, uh, and I've heard this from some Google engineers, is when they set this up, uh, every person who visits this display, the first thing they search for is their house, their own address. <laughs> You want to see yourself. You want to have a sense of where, where am I in this global context? And if it requires flying from you know just over Japan in the stratosphere down to your house, that's an amazing sense of context, uh, and it gives you that real geographic center. Um, so I personally like to do the same thing, um, and I like to do this through uh, a, a historical change as well. Um, this is the, the Winooski River, uh, almost to the delta, but between Colchester and the Intervale here uh, in Burlington. Uh, this is 1937, the imagery that I mentioned before. Uh, and I, I like this one because it shows that Vermont is pretty resolute. Vermont doesn't change in a lot of ways. So this is 2017. Uh, still farm, still forest, still field. Um, and then in other ways, uh, this is Mallet's Bay a little bit further, actually, this part of the image was in the previous one we looked at. Um, Vermont is a bit more dynamic. Uh, and something that's fascinating about this one is look how much forest has come up. This was, uh, it's, it's really interesting to see the tree cover increase in tandem with the, with the human cover. Uh, this is 2017, and then before was 1937. So the 80-year split basically transformed this part of Mallet's Bay completely from agricultural landscape to uh, suburban landscape. Um, so my point with this, though, is that I, I like to center myself. This is uh, one of the areas where uh, I first came back to when I um, returned to Vermont after a long time. In particular, this, um, is it, didn't the arrow come up down there? Ah, there we go. So that is a spot that um, I, I was born in Vermont, raised in Vermont, I went to college in Vermont, left for a time, and then uh, came back when uh, my wife got a, an amazing scholarship at UVM for a PhD. Uh, I was like, that's great, let's move back to Vermont. Uh, the first place we, we came back was a, a condo that we bought in an old farmhouse here on the corner of um, Goss Court and North Avenue in Burlington. Uh, and the landscape is a zoom of what we were seeing before in Colchester. It's, it's uh, lots of trees, but this is a human landscape. Look at all those straight lines. Um, and the way it looked in 1937 was considerably different. <laughs> uh, and the house is still there. It was, a, it was a farmhouse from the late 1800s. It turned into condos for our benefit. But um, you can see there's like some institutional thing that's not there now. But, um, this landscape is home. I'm trying to understand what it looked like in the past. And that 1937 series gives me this amazing sense of context. Um, in the same way that the, the map of Philadelphia gives me an amazing socioeconomic context for my family. And the way the map of Germany gives me an amazing, just, you know, emotional sense of context. Um, and that, I think, is the essence of maps, no matter how much power we get, uh, no matter how detailed our maps are, we still try to center ourselves. Um, and I, I honestly think that's going to be 
the thing that saves us as mapping technology gets more and more advanced is our ability to contextualize and look for home and everything. Okay, thank you. I apologize. I think I'm running off. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. I do. I was on a mountain in New Hampshire when they were correcting the elevation oh, yeah. on the mountain, and I wondered if they still used the same technique. They knew a distance to the base and a right angle up, and then they shot a laser beam of yeah. the hypotenuse, and they timed it to see when it came back down, and that gave them the elevation. Do they still use that technique? That um, was probably 30 years ago. Interesting. Timing is not a method I have heard of. No, um, it's yeah. The time it came up from the valley, you could see the pulse, and then they that Probably measurement of the distance, the length. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, I think that the, the geodetic stuff that people use now, geologists have all sorts of fun yeah, toys, but I think uh, the stuff that they tend to use are um, correlations with uh, magnetic readings from space, which are, is a little bit crazy. We have magnetic sensing satellites yeah. that are checking, okay, the Earth has actually slightly changed its diameter here. Um, but in combination with uh, LIDAR, which is like LIDAR, the, the light version yeah, of radar. Yeah, okay, I hope yeah, you talk so. more about LIDAR, too. Oh, man. Yeah, well, some of the, some of the things I've shown come from yeah. LIDAR. Um, Thank you. So but, it's a new technique. Yeah, right? I, I think I, I haven't heard of the timed version. That's interesting. Yeah. I think all digital me measurements are done with laser. Yeah. They send out a laser beam, they time it coming back to the right. millimicrosecond. Yeah, totally. Yeah. The German distance is probably to perhaps millimeter. That's what, yeah, the, the professional surveyors will tell you that uh, the, the GIS stuff that I learned 20 years ago is useless because it's not precise to the, you know, to the centimeter. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that um, I, I'm not a surveyor. I don't know enough about what they use, but I wonder how long that, that sensible light ping between locations has been used instead of chains. Because uh, that was, for the longest time, that was the, the way so it was. real tape, but uh, that, yeah. that, that, that's a lost, yeah. lost skill. <laughs> lost art. Um, sorry, uh, yes? This isn't so much of a question as a comment. I'm an astronomer, and I noticed that all of your I maps... I saw the NASA shirt there. All of your maps are in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in uh, 19... probably 68, this is in connection with your uh, spy satellite. Mm -hmm. This is a few years before that spy satellite picture. The chair of our department and the director of our observatory we were planning to build a large telescope in West Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was going around talking to people and went to an optical plant where they made large uh, mirrors oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Saw all of these big mi mirrors, you know, just sort of there. He knew what astronomers were planning to build in the way of telescopes, and he knew that those were not them. Maybe they were calibrated for looking down instead? He figured that they were planning to put those telescopes up into space and point them in the wrong direction, <laughs> as far as astronomers were concerned. <laughs> and so, you know, it became clear that these spy satellites, you know, although it was very secret at the time, mm. it was so secret that when I was working on the Hubble Telescope Project ten years later, we wanted to test the mirror of the Hubble telescope, which, as you recall, came out bad because of it's still working things out with that one. Yeah, well, that's that. been fixed. That's been fixed. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the, the the mirror figure was was wrong. It was it was <coughs> wrong at the edge. It was a little too flat by about the width of a human hair at the edge compared to the center, and that was enough to make it so that you couldn't so the the, the images could not be they were all blurred. But the the, the astronomers. That I, on the working group that I was a member of, uh, said that we need to test that mirror and we need to test the whole optical system before we put this telescope in orbit. Now we knew, it was rumored, let's put it, that, so that there was a test facility that could have done it that the Air Force had. Okay. But we were not allowed, allowed to know about that, and <laughs> therefore we weren't allowed to use it. Therefore, we would have had to have spent $2 million to build the te test facility ourselves. The project said, that's too expensive. So the project in ended up spending an extra $2 billion fixing the problem. Wow. Oh, man. So that's what the secrecy of the spy satellite program. That's, 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 it wasn't secret. 
People knew about it, but they were trying to pretend that it was secret. Yeah. Pennywise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the like space. Whether you're looking at Earth or looking outward, it seems to me it's generally a good example of how we work together as humans, like as you know, some sort of great communitarian effort. Um, but then there's there's always anecdotes like that. There's some form of bureaucracy or some form of secrecy and competition is like sort of shooting it down. But um, man, that was is it the late, the new telescope that has some issue with it still? Um, uh, what happened was. Uh, we figured out the, what the amount of the, the, the incorrectness of the curvature of the mirror was. And, they, they, and at the time, you could send a space shuttle up. The right. space right. shuttle is no longer around. You could send a space shuttle up and replace an instrument with a, another version of the instrument. Mm -hmm. So they replaced the instruments with, instru with instruments that had corrected optics that would exactly correct for the bad mirror. I can picture so a all of the stuff that's to... come out since 1993, which was three years after the telescope was launched, have all been with the corrected optics, and that's why we have these wonderful pictures from Hubble Telescope today. Yeah. They're so sharp and wonderful. And those are, those are amazing to see, and thank you yeah. for your work on that. But we, we all benefit. It's very cool to see. Uh, uh, yeah? I'm curious about a handheld compass. Might want to repeat her question. Yeah, certainly. Um, the question is when handheld compasses uh, were first put into use. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a solid answer for that. There is a solid answer, and I will probably Google it later. <laughs> but, um, the, the best that I know is that um, early, uh, like probably 11th century, um, they started being able to use directional implementations of some kind, which is one of the reasons that um, the, the, the Danes and the Norwegians were so successful in making it from Europe to Iceland to Greenland to, um, to uh, Newfoundland. I don't know exactly when the magnetic compass as we know it today came into being, but it's certainly been around for at least 200 years, because I know that um, it's been a major tool of navigation since then. Uh, Sorry, I wish I had a better answer. Um, then I'll, I'll be back. Yes? Um, I'm writing a young adult biography of James Wilson, who created the first American Globe in 1810. Oh, cool. And he was Bradford, Vermont. And he never saw any of the world except Hanover and New Haven, Connecticut. He walked down there to learn how to engrave oh. the globe. But um, I'm finding, as I work on it, that the, just how political the globes were. Um, that his first globe came out in, uh, in 1810, and the uh, Upper West was Sioux country and Cherokee country, and stuff like that. But when uh, the next round of globes came out in 1810, those are completely erased. We have just oh, wow. politically done away with the Indian problem. Yeah. And uh, I, I find that really interesting, yes, that we, uh, uh, Lewis and Clark walk across the country, sort of owned it, so to speak. Right, yep. And from then on, the U.S. owned it, and the uh, uh, Native American tribes do not. Right. Um, well, but he, brought, he did his whole globe. And they're in the Smithsonian now, and they're at Yale and Princeton um, and Norwich. That's the closest one to here. Um, reading the uh, uh, 1790 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. He didn't see any of these places. He just Did you say James Wilson? James Wilson. James Wilson. All right, I gotta look him up. You'll have to wait for the book. Yeah, oh, that's true. <laughs> Which will be easy to read for you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm sorry, there was one of the uh, Well, I just wanted to thank you for making it so personal, your personal history and taking us through. Thanks I was listening. born in 1937. Really? So. <laughs> oh, you're the, you're the person that centers the map. That's great. <laughs> and we had an FHA mortgage. Really? Wow. <laughs> and um, <coughs> the farm that I grew up on in Waitsfield, um, there, there was somebody came through with an airplane taking pictures of all the farms. 
and selling them to people. So I have a wonderful aerial view of our, of our farm, the way it looked in 1950. And uh, these things just are so personal. And then I'm thinking, when, I, when my daughter moved somewhere and all I had was a street address, I went on Google or somewhere, I don't even know what it was, and I could find the building on the street in Florida where she lived, you know. Was it Street View, like a picture of the front door of the building? Like oh, yeah, 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 and the street and the whole neighborhood, and you could, you know, pull it up and get a big view and down and get something. Did that, did that help, like, feel a little bit closer? Or? Yeah, oh, yeah, you feel yeah. like you know where she lived. <laughs> yeah, things, things have advanced a bit. See the cars Thank on you. the streets. Yeah, that's what I know. Oh, really like it. Too, so. Um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I was wrapped. <laughs>